everyone and thank you very much for joining us today and for those who are online, I'm hoping the streaming is working, we've got our fingers firmly crossed, it's going to stand up to it to the, to the pressure today. Um, I'm Sarah Porter, I'm a visitor here at the moment at the Oxford Internet Institute and we've got a really fascinating afternoon we hope, controversial I'm sure, we're expecting a bit of controversy and, uh, and I know people are fueled up ready with their own personal views and preferences and <laughs> ideas and thoughts about um, about these areas. Um, if there's one thing we can say about both OER and MOOCs, there's uh, a great deal of hype and noise around them, so uh, so we want to hear your noise later on. Um, we've got three sort of 15-20 minute presentations. I'm going to go first, then Rebecca Aynon and team will be next, and sorry, Aynon and team will be next, and oh sorry, no, well, I'm going first, then, then Professor Gronio Canoli is going, and then Rebecca Aynon. Um, and then we'll, we hope to have about half an hour left for discussion questions, raising issues, debate, and so on and so forth. Um, we also uh, have a drinks reception. So that, those are the approximate timings, the three short presentations, then some discussion, and then drinks. So, uh, And we have to thank ESRC for sponsoring this seminar series. Um, I don't know if you can see the poster there on the right. Um, and thank you to our postgraduate students who work together to get the funding from the SRC um, and this is the second of three seminars that are running in Breaking Boundaries looking at a range of different um, issues to do with using ICT and, and breaking down boundaries and learning participation in society so a bit of a plug this this is two of, th of three so please do come to three if you can which is Thursday the 13th of March it says there and that's at the Department of Education um, and the seminar series is multidisciplinary so that's one of the quite nice things about it. I think it's it's sponsored by students from a range of different discipline areas, particularly um, education and, and here, OIR, but <coughs> other places also. Uh, so, so we really are trying to open up the debate. Okay, so I'm going to go first, and I apologise for sitting, <laughs> sort of half sitting. I'm getting a bit out of breath. I'm a bit breathless, but I'm seven months pregnant. <laughs> so... Um, so I'm, the baby is competing today with MOOCs and OER, but, um, but I, hope, I hope it will go okay, and, uh, and I'm certainly not planning to give birth quite yet, um, so we should be fine. Um, I'm just going to give a bit of context and uh, pull out some issues from my experience. Until recently I worked at JISC, which is a funding body um, that has been funding quite a lot of research, development projects, innovation in, in this area. For I worked there for 12 years before um, before coming to OII to be a visitor. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that experience, um, and particularly around open educational resources. Um, and what we learned there, and I think what it does tell us about breaking down boundaries and whether that was successful or not. And then I'll give a bit of a, a kind of vanilla overview to MOOCs and some of the things that I, I personally think about MOOCs. So I'm going to do a bit of fact and fiction because I think there's a lot there actually that, that is, we're seeing about MOOCs. And it's a very fast changing landscape. So, um, so I'm sure you won't agree with everything I say. You may not agree with anything I say, um, but we've got time to talk about those things later, which I think is good. Um, so starting with a fact, um, and I've, uh, Terry, Professor Terry Anderson from Athabasca University, I thank for, for this slide. Um, openness is <coughs> a fact, and, and, I, and I'm mentioning this because this is really important context, I think, for both OER and MOOCs. Um, they can seem, if you believe what you read in the press, to have come out of nowhere and to have no grounding in, in any kind of context. And that can be quite frustrating for people like myself who've worked in this area for quite a number of years. Um, I think the openness agenda, we could go on and on. We, there's all sorts of issues around what do you mean by open and all the different flavors of openness. And I, I think we will probably get into that in some of, particularly the MOOC debate, but actually it applies equally in OER. And I think in OER world, there's a lot of controversy there about what we do mean by openness and how open is open and the, the issues around licensing, uh, as well as issues around reuse and sharing. Um, but I think we can see that both OER and MOOCs have come out of these various trends. It's quite interesting to see that, that things that have been moving along for a number of years, particularly open source software, actually, which, um, and so we've got a very clear um, technological movement there, which is a very philosophical technological movement that was very much driven by people 
doing things with a, a set of beliefs and a belief system. And, and I think if we read the history on OER, open education resources, that's very much come out of the open source movement, actually, but with a different perspective on it, because people who are also interested in altruism and the philosophical movement of some of the, the, the fundamentals about the right to open education. Um, so some of the things you'll recognise, well, you'll recognise all of them, but, it, but we don't always think of these things in the same place, but actually um, open government really needs <coughs> And actually, in the research space, something else I'm quite interested in is open access publishing. And, and we're seeing an equal, a parallel track there of openness there. And what does that mean for the industry of publishing? And what does that mean for all of us who, are, who play roles in that, that, um, that ecosystem? Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so talking a little more about open educational resources I'm not going to go into definitions today because I assume people generally know what open educational resources are although even trying to narrow down definition is interesting because open educational resources the word technology doesn't appear in there there is no technical word in there actually an open educational resource could be a book actually if it's open um, it might have a particular license around it, it might have access issues so so I think it you know we've grasped onto that as now having a set of meanings um, but actually it could mean quite a lot of different things. Um, but I wanted to give you an example of the UK Open Education Resources <coughs> Programme, the work that, that was done by JISC, the Higher Education Academy, funded by the Higher Education Funding Council for England. Um, and this is a sort of pathway through that story. And then and I just want you to be thinking about opening up access and breaking down boundaries and to what extent actually we can say this programme was successful in doing that interesting one and I think there are probably people in this room who were involved in that program in some ways or another. Um, personally I think it was actually very successful but it's interesting to what extent um, centrally funded initiatives can actually create change and break boundaries. Does that really happen? So the program ran in three phases um, from 2009 till late 2012. Actually the repercussions of some of that work are still going on, people are still doing some of the, the things around there. It hasn't finished completely but that was the kind of formal funding cycle um, and 5.7 million pounds so a quite substantial sum of money um, put into that um, and it very much followed on from <coughs> the trends of OER work that were being done by people like MIT through OpenCourseWare, um, the, the declarations about OER that were coming out of various different international foundations um, and so again this idea of OER is something of a philosophical concept I suppose a practical concept, yes, we can create course materials, and if we're doing that, why shouldn't we open those up and share them with people? Um, you know, we can also <coughs> perhaps sign up to that as, as academics um, and as people supporting, you know, the academic and learning process. Um, but, but I think um, it became something more than that, as in, you know, OER became a badge, a symbol. There's, there's a whole thing about, should we have UK OER as a hashtag anymore? <laughs> because, you know, it's creating a community and there's very much a sense of within UK OER with these programmes there's a set of different distinct communities who've interacted with that and where you have a set of communities you have people who are outside those communities and I think it can be hard for people to break into those so um, so through the phases of the programme the first one these are the sort of key questions we were trying to um, to address we were find, looking at things about how to just the fundamentals of how to release OER looking at what do creators want to do with them and thinking about issues of sustainability um, and um, answered some of those questions and there are there are links in the, the slides and things to um, info kits which are kind of guidance kits that help people to understand some of the, the answers to some of those questions. Um, the second phase we were looking about at, at discovering use of OER because obviously that's one of the big challenges there can be as much content out there if you like but if no one can find it um, we, what we know about the barriers of entry for teaching staff when they're trying to find resources to share, how difficult that is and how hard it is to understand um, quality and understand licensing and, and um, what is legitimate and what is not. So it's about trying to lower those barriers. And part of that, went, um, part of that work led to using the Joram, the National Learning Object Repository that was set up to do to um, host OER, but again, that was interesting, it's Jorum, J-O-R-U-M, I'll put some links up later to that, um, but interesting, as soon as you start to create a place to put content, then 
that means people have to go to that place to find it. And, you know, we know from looking at practice and research into the way that people learn and teach, they don't necessarily want to go somewhere to find things. They want the things to come to them. They want them to be available at the right time. So, so there have been some issues and challenges around that. Um, looking at what users want to do uh, with OER and also, again, sustainability. And that led, led into um, all sorts of outcomes there. I'll say a little more about impact in a moment. And then in the third phase, we were looking at OER and related practices to meet identified strategic and cultural needs, so specific needs of the sectors at that time, and looking what looking at the range of different um, use cases for for teachers, for for learners, um, for those supporting um, practice as well. <coughs> um, and so some of the outcomes from that work can are quite impressive, I think, in some ways. Um, I think over 70% of the UK universities applied to be part of the programme and in the end over 100 of them were involved. So actually that's quite significant because um, in these sort of big change initiatives <coughs> it can actually be very hard to attract more than the early adopters and the innovators mm -hmm. to actually get involved and it does often tend to be the same people over and over again who get involved with these things. So that was quite impressive. What was also impressive about that was when we started the programme no one had heard of OER actually apart from you know the Illuminati, if you like, <laughs> so the people who, who were interested in OER and already had an interest in that. Um, people running universities certainly had never heard of OER, but by the time we got into the second and third phases, people were saying, well, what are we doing? What are we doing in our institution? What sh sh you know, I've heard of this thing. And sometimes that is just money attracts attention. There is no doubt about that. Um, you know, as soon as you put a sum against something, people will go, well, it must be important then, whether it is or not. It, but, you know, it's an enabler, isn't it? But we certainly got a great deal of interest. Um, and um, so over 100 um, universities involved, several thousand resources. I mean, that's changing. Very wide range of subject areas, all sorts of subject areas, which, again, is always one of the challenges of digital content and sharing content. Um, that was covered and particularly important I think lots of communities of practice were created and there was a very good synthesis and evaluation study done alongside the programme all the way through it um, and that really focused a lot on how there were these communities that were being established and that are actually self-sustaining today I believe I am told you know I'd like to believe that's true um, certainly in certain areas that work particularly well in certain disciplines and where there were there was perhaps prior experience of working together that really worked well um, but impact is a much harder question and um, and impact and you know I hate to say it but value for money is a very hard question to answer with these sorts of programs particularly when you're looking at um, some of the the actual benefit that you're trying to get from the work may not happen that year or the next year it may be in three years five years or ten years and it's also extremely hard to track when you've got open content with open licenses. You can't say to people, you've got to sign up here <laughs> and tell us what you're using it for. So it's very difficult to track, you know, who's using things and, and when. Um, but relating it back to the kind of theme of the of today and um, breaking boundaries, um, I thought this quote was interesting. This is my sort of last my last comment on, on OER, and I know it will come up again later. But um, so this came from the evaluation and census study that, that was done by, um, by some researchers and has been written up in a book called Reusing Open Resources, but it's also, all their resources are online, I've got a reference to it. Um, so I think there's some important things to this, to the question of broadening access to education. Um, it's this question about communities, really, and, and what they found in um, the aims of the programme that, that we ran about open, openly releasing OER and, and opening up practice meant that though there was a kind of a disbenefit in that the release <coughs> often was within, within specific communities and so and actually presented major barriers to successful release and, and I think that's very pertinent <coughs> to what we're thinking about because if the, the OER model is predicated on creating then communities of people sharing around those things if then that the fact that you've created a community means that, that other people are a lot less likely to pick up those things and use them again, then we're just not achieving what we were hoping for. And, and, and I think the, the evidence of um, 
resources being picked up and used outside those communities that were established is fairly scant, actually. There are, ex there are exceptions, and I'd love to hear more, you know, but actually, um, in, so, and in terms of then looking at um, outside the UK, for example, and trying to really open up education through where we are elsewhere, what actually seems to be more successful is running their own programmes. So, and that's what you actually see, that's been the model. So we had sort of MIT doing open course where, and then other people did similar things. Um, JISC and HEA did the, this program and at the same time other people have been doing similar programs in Africa in India in South America and so on. The model seems to be predicated on national central funding of some kind of some sort of agency putting dollars or pounds um, some, or euros down you know and, <coughs> and encouraging people to do this. It seems to be quite difficult to find a mechanism for, to encourage people just to pick up and use these things. So, so that's perhaps something to come back to later. I mean, I think Bonner, I'm sure, will have things to say on that. Um, so, so in terms of broadening access, not, not too sure. Um, so MOOCs. <laughs> well, it began in Canada. <laughs> Um, what can we say? Uh, I quite like this one as well. Um, we've got someone here who used to work at Stanford many years ago. I think um, I, lo I love this quote. The biggest course ever rocks higher education with anxiety. <laughs> so um, it's, been, it's been an interesting thing, hasn't it, in the last sort of two or three years, MOOCs and um, the amount of hype around them. Um, I think I've got my hype cycle next. Um, and the amount of chat at all levels that um, it has generated, the amount of media coverage. I mean, I've been working in educational technology for getting on for 20 years. No one's ever been slightly interested in what we've been doing in the media. Um, the thought of a Guardian journalist phoning up to ask for a quote about you know, OER, dare I say, let alone um, e-learning and pedagogy or VLEs, <laughs> you know, as we used to be sort of looking at, it just wouldn't happen. <coughs> and, and now not a week goes by without something in the Times Higher or the Guardian or the Times or the Telegraph even, you know, and that's just in the UK. If we look at the international press, it, you go, it goes on and on and on. And, and you've got to ask yourself why, you know, and, and obviously we've had this, um, this hype cycle that that we're, we, we've been through um, the very early days, and actually I think you could argue, as you do, it's been going much longer than that, and actually I'll talk about something in a while that has been going much longer than 2011. 2012 was the year of the MOOCs. 2013, getting the negative view, we're going into the trough. And I think now probably quite a lot of us feel we're well and truly in the trough. <laughs> and uh, are we, I'm not sure we're quite up on the slope yet, and we're certainly not on the plateau of productivity. Um, and, and I think, it, yeah, it's interesting to, to ask ourselves why this has happened in such a way. Uh, I think um, we, can, we could talk about that at length, um, really. And th there's a lot to do with money. There's a lot to do with um, costs of tuition fees. And there's a lot to do with um, challenging the ivory towers, I think, and breaking down those boundaries. And, and, and also people I've always found working in any kind of technology-related area, people always hope for a magic bullet of some kind and are always looking for the latest thing that comes along that is going to change the world this time and they want to actually believe that that's the truth and um, and MOOCs has been one of those things that people have hooked, hooked onto and, and believed it will and and there's some element of truth in that maybe but there's a lot that's not so I'm going to talk about just for about five minutes um, before I hand over Gwanya a little bit of MOOC fiction and a little bit of MOOC facts from my perspective and and what I hope I'm doing with this is to sow some seeds for you to think about and we'll be challenging and well I hope Gronny will probably challenge some of this and Rebecca and team but um but also to come back in a discussion and talk more so um I think in this sort of trough of disillusionment where we're we're all floundering at the moment these are, these are the sort of meat fiction things that we were talking about so firstly moots are only being run by elite institutions in order to market themselves well some of that that's certainly not the whole picture. Um, 
Secondly, MOOC learners are all Western males over the age of 26. <coughs> People love that one. There's, there's been reports out recently that say, you know, this many percentage. And well, that's part of the picture, but that's certainly not all of it. And also, MOOCs aren't really being used. Everyone signs up, but only hardly anyone completes a whole MOOC. And so they're crap, <laughs> basically. That's what, you know, that, that, that's the kind of, this is our reaction in the trough to, uh, to, the, to the earlier hype. Um, and there is some truth in all of those things, but I think looking at, looking at it in a more constructive way and as an opportunity and as something that um, is attracting a great deal of attention and for us as professionals and researchers <coughs> and those with an interest in this area, for us to, um, to learn and draw from, let's make the most of what we have got out there, which is an incredibly rich source of um, people in, engaged in something in a way that they've never been before that's happened extremely quickly and that is actually at the start of its development cycle. Um, I mean, it may it may di disappear again within a year. Personally, I don't believe it will. I mean, I think it will go on and it will change very fast. Um, but um, what we do know is there are at least 8 million people using MOOCs at the moment. Um, there's nothing else in online learning that's that's had that number of people so quickly. And, um, and they are using, they're from all over the world. They're from um, all different ages, actually. And um, I think what we need to focus more on in thinking about the potential for breaking boundaries and, and opening up um, education to other people is not all MOOCs are the same. So uh, the MOOC critics, the sort of, there's a sort of particular, there are particular groups of people, I'm sure who, some of whom are here and some are watching on the stream. Um, you know, and I, I have part of the critic in my head as well, I would say. But actually, to be more constructive about that, and see the opportunity we've got with MOOCs, with the volume of people and the, the range of courses um, and the speed of, of change and development, the speed of investment, is to say not all MOOCs are the same, actually, at all. And we're already seeing that we've got a range of subject areas, a range of different learning styles and approaches being used. Um, different countries, different individuals are developing courses and already starting to change the way they do things. So there's this kind of cliche that um, the X, whatever, fill in your, um, your big platform name, MOOC, all it is is a load of videos <coughs> that are very shiny and um, a forum where the, the learners support each other and a bit of a, a not very good automated assessment at the end and typically only 5 to 10% people complete it. But actually, I mean, I've, I've been a MOOC consumer, as I'm sure a lot of you have, um, not necessarily the whole way through it, but for bits of things. And actually, neither of them were like that at all. They were completely different. So, um, you know, we're already seeing that teachers, good teachers and good learners will do what they want to do and they will they will create things in different ways. And there, there's an opportunity for that to really change a great deal, particularly as we engage with learners in lots of different places and for different purposes. And MOOCs are being created <coughs> for lots of different purposes. There's definitely a marketing element to it, but there is also an element of... Um, real experimentation and um, an opportunity for universities as the main providers <laughs> at the moment to engage with learners on a scale they're just not it's just not possible to do at the moment and I'm I'm researching a book about MOOCs at the moment and the interviews I've been doing what's been coming out is how many institutions are investing in this because it's giving them access to thousands of people they can find out more about what they're doing and what they're learning They've got the opportunity to rewrite the course as they go along and make changes. So if, you know, all the learners have a problem with a the task, they can rewrite it that day. And actually, some of them have been doing that. They go and they rewrite it. The learners uh, then respond to that and they can move it on. In a traditional university scenario, you'll be maybe doing your course evaluation at the end of term. The students probably will never give you anything back about what they thought of the course materials. They'll probably do an exam and disappear out of your lives forever. Um, you don't have that laboratory um, there to work from. So I think that's just one way that, that, um, that we can be more positive about the opportunity that MOOCs afford us. Um, and also this thing about completion rates, and I'm sure it's an interesting one, because if completion rates are based on um, looking at who initially signs up for a course and then who completes it, clearly you're going to get a very low percentage completion because... All of us have signed up for things and never done anything more with them. That's just that's how it is, really. Um, so um, already they're starting. People are starting to look more at, 
you know, for example, if the student finishes the first week of the MOOC, that's a much better indicator then of whether they're likely to progress through. Um, and then we're seeing different completion rates and up to 40, 50 percent in some cases. Also, if people are targeting particular groups with particular interests, again, we're seeing very different completion rates. But I also think we have to ask ourselves, well, if we're doing things online, um, at the moment, the <coughs> model is very much about, you know, you go in, you study it as a course for six weeks or ten weeks or something, and you're supposed to be a good student and work through that and want the certificate at the end, perhaps. But actually, if, if I am just interested in one concept of those six weeks and I follow that and I get what I want from it, then am I, is that, <coughs> is that not valid? You know, have I not got something from it? Has the, the university that's offering perhaps not also got something from it? So, so I think that's what I mean about this being, it's just very early days and we need to, to wait and see, I think, with some of these things um, and do a lot more research really on what's happening. Um, and giving you one example, um, that doesn't get talked about a lot is something called Alison, which calls itself the original MOOC, which I find quite quite amusing. But that that's not one of the sort of well-known platforms, and that's not being run by a university. Actually, it's part of being run by a company. Um, they are they they run um, 600 courses, um, and they've got over three million users worldwide. And their biggest growth area is actually in India. Um, and the sorts of things they're offering are what they call essential certified workplace skills, so things like business and finance and languages. Um, and they have a kind of business model that's becoming familiar to us, which is free content, free support, but then if you want certification, you pay for that. And interestingly, they also charge for course management. So one of us at another institution could run, use their content, run a course, and they charge us a small amount for doing that as well. Um, <coughs> So, um, you know, I think in terms of broadening access, there are examples out there that actually have been beavering away in the background for some time that are really successful um, and are, are showing they're getting into all kinds of different markets and, um, and areas of the world that, that we don't necessarily know about them. We, it's easy to believe the hype, I think. Um, and then, um, I mean, I've covered some of this, but just some more facts from my perspective. There isn't a single MOOC model, actually. There isn't just one way that everybody's running MOOCs, whatever people may say. Um, the content and the, the approaches vary <laughs> a lot, and they are revolving very fast. And I think that's what we're seeing as well, is that there's bottom-up and top-down innovation going on. But it's, you know, teachers are really getting stuck in there and trying out new things and getting support to do that, which is which, after many years of underinvestment in, in um, pedagogy, really, I think is actually quite quite, quite a positive thing. Um, as I said, I think we're just at the beginning of seeing um, what MOOCs will offer, and it's a very, very fast rate of development and growth at the moment, and much faster than in anything you know, I've seen previously. Um, some of the things, and there's this concept of blended MOOCs, which someone mentioned to me last week, and you know, they've just come up with it in their institution, but where they are um, they're developing a MOOC for an external audience, but they're also using it with their undergraduates, so they you know, <coughs> as you'd expect, undergraduates are there for part of the course, they all then go online, so they're with a much bigger audience of people in a, a wider cohort, and then they, the undergraduates finish on campus, and the others finish you know, with their certification. So, you know, there's lots of potential around some of these things. Um, accreditation and so on, course length varying, all these things. Um, and I think motivation, really, I mean, we don't... We don't really know much at all about what participants are really getting from MOOCs. We don't really know a lot about why they do them. Um, and we don't really know about what they're achieving with them. But we do know it's very varied um, and it's likely to, to get more varied. Um, this, there's this piece of work that the Stanford Learning Analytics Group has done where they, you know, they're just looking at different types of people and the percentages across it. So they've just come up with these categories. You might be auditing checking the course out, you might want to complete, you might be a disengaged learner, you might be a sampler, someone who just comes in and tests and goes away again. Um, I've got a reference to this at the end. So already we can start to say of a big population, we shouldn't just assume they're all Western men over 26 who've got the same motive. And even if they are, they can have all sorts of motivation for why they want to engage. Um, and then finally, um, just some kind of MOOC assertions. So some some food for thought really um, for me I suppose I mean I think 
MOOC participants represent a huge population, <coughs> lots of different disciplines, lots of different demographics, demographics, different motivation, and, and people come from very different contexts. And so it, making sweeping statements about them is, is not that helpful, really. Um, I think, secondly, we could talk for hours about this one as well, which is fascinating, but now that we're using the sort of network technologies, data collection analysis tools, the sort of big data things and analytics, it gives us an absolutely amazing opportunity to understand more about how learners interact with each other and with content, and we'll pick up on some of that in Rebecca's talk. Um, you know, we've never been able to do that before at that scale, so there's just so much we can, we can do with that. And I really think there is significant potential to, to shape a more inclusive, flexible and learner-focused education, notwithstanding that's not what everyone is necessarily will be wanting to do, and business models and costs and so on will get involved in here, but we have got the opportunity. So, so that's my little spiel. Um, and there's some references I can, I'm sure we'll share slides around. So, um, so I'll hand over to Gronya. So I think we're going to blast you with our presentations now, and then.